Uh, the United Kingdom has been described by one leading British commentator as the epicentre of the culture of death. Uh, the International Planned Parenthood Federation, the biggest uh, abortion-promoting agency in the world, was founded and has its headquarters in London. We have the British Abortion Act, of course, which has been exported, as it were, to common law countries throughout the world and directly and indirectly has cost uh, tens, hundreds of millions of unborn lives. We have the Overseas Development Agency, which, as Uju, Obi and Uju Akiocha will be telling us, uh, is busily promoting abortion in developing countries around the world. And, of course, we were the forerunners of human embryo research legislation and the uh, creation of human-animal hybrid embryos and their destruction, etc., etc. It really is a scandal, though, for the anti-life, pro-abortion movement that here in the UK, Northern Ireland has not brought in uh, widespread legal abortion. It's resisted abortion in Northern Ireland. And this is a, a scandal, I would say, for the pro-abortion lobby. And it's a major achievement of the pro-life movement worldwide that here in the UK there is one corner that has upheld the sanctity of human life. It's also a great achievement which has been due, I think, overwhelmingly due to the stand taken by the Democratic Unionist Party over the decades. They have protected not only Northern Ireland, but the whole of Ireland, uh, by their persistent, courageous, principled stand. And I've never known anywhere in the world where people work together so closely from all parties and all faiths. People find it odd when I say that. I can only tell you it's true, and anybody who goes there, it's true, uh, will say it's true. Uh, they played a key role in a, a lobby of John Major when he was Prime Minister and there was a committee looking into the legalisation of abortion. And John Major was deeply impressed that so many people came together and were willing to take a united stand on this, both in Northern Ireland and in the Westminster Parliament. Under Gordon Brown's government, there was a big effort led by John Burko, heard that name, um, who was... Uh, seeking to put down pro-abortion amendments which would have resulted in the kind of situation that we, with which we're threatened today. And Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, our speaker today, said to a huge rally, he was health minister at the time, that he would not implement this law in Northern Ireland. And so they have continued the battle. They worked uh, as SPUC lobbied and sent in submissions to ensure that the domestic abuse bill couldn't be used as a vehicle to introduce abortion. But naturally, we've all been disappointed by what has happened with regard to the executive formation bill, and we'll be looking forward to hearing what Sir Geoffrey has to say in his talk on that, battling to defend unborn children in Northern Ireland. At the age of 18... Sir Geoffrey served in the British Army in the 7th City of Belfast Battalion, the Ulster Defence Regiment, in which he re reached the rank of corporal. He's a member of the Privy Council. He's a member of Parliament for La Lagan Valley, representing the Democratic Unionist Party, of which he holds the office of Chief Whip. And he's Northern Ireland's, Northern Ireland's longest-serving uh, member of Parliament. He's one of 21 MPs who voted against the LGBT inclusive relationships and sex education in English schools with which our children and grandchildren are so sorely threatened. Thank you for that and for so much else, for Sir Geoffrey. And he's married to... And, and most importantly, he's married to Eleanor, with whom he's had two daughters, Sir Geoffrey Johnson.
Thank you, John, for your, uh, your words of welcome. And thank you to uh, Spock for inviting me this morning to uh, your conference. And it's a pleasure to be here. It's been a busy, busy week at Westminster. And uh, uh, so it's, it's good to um, join uh, in some sanity here uh, and, and, and in an atmosphere of calm. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to talk about an issue about which I feel passionately and uh, that is for me as a member of parliament so, so important. But before I speak uh, um, of uh, my own views, can I uh, most sincerely as a member of parliament for 22 years now say a huge thank you to the Society for the Protection of the Unborn Child for all that you do to support me and other members of parliament who are on the front line seeking to protect the dignity of human life. Thank you for your work tirelessly, day in and day out. Thank you for the support that you give as an organization to people like me, public representatives. Uh, thank you to John and the team in London who are ever active in engaging with parliament. Thank you to Liam and the team in Northern Ireland who have been very supportive as well and very helpful uh, to us uh, in terms of providing. Uh, I, I described Liam to uh, his boss, uh, Maria, as he's my armorer. He provides me with the ammunition that I need um, when I'm uh, debating on these issues. And uh, I really appreciate the work of Spock in seeking to uphold uh, the dignity of human life and protecting the life of the unborn child. Uh, John referred to Northern Ireland and that Northern Ireland has been a bit of a battleground uh, on these issues uh, over the years. I grew up in a Northern Ireland that was deeply troubled. I grew up in a Northern Ireland where at times there were those who did not have any respect for the dignity of human life, who dispensed with human life without a thought. And I think many of us in Northern Ireland, because of that experience, came to really value human life in all its forms, from conception to the grave. And I think I, I want to explain that to you because that's why we're passionate in my party about protecting the dignity of human life. Because we've seen what humanity can do. We've seen the worst of humanity. But we also in Northern Ireland see the best of humanity. The tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands of people in Northern Ireland who share our passion to protect the life of unborn children because we believe in the dignity of human life. And I am proud to say, coming from Northern Ireland, that because we resisted the 1967 Abortion Act, because we've never had that act in Northern Ireland. There are today, in my part of the United Kingdom, research shows 100,000 of my fellow citizens who are alive today who would not be alive if we hadn't stood for their right to life. And it is no wonder, it is no wonder that our opponents hate that statistic. They want to ban that statistic. They went to court to prevent advertisements declaring that statistic. And the court ruled that actually it was credible to say that all of those people were alive today because we didn't have the 1967 Abortion Act. You know, at times when I look, if I may for a moment, look at the wider aspect of the United Kingdom, a lot of the debate we have today in this country is about the changing demographic. We're becoming an older population, partly because we're living longer and we're, we are thankful for that, but also because our birth rate has declined. And government research shows that if we are to sustain our position economically, we need to find another three million Three million people to make the UK economically sustainable. We need to have three million working people to sustain our economy. Now, just let's think about that for a moment. 
How many abortions have there been since 1967? Mathematics was not my best subject at school, but even I can work out that the problems we have today can be linked to some of the decisions we've taken in the past. And whilst I am passionate in my belief and in my defense of the dignity of human life as an ethical issue, even if you want to deal with this in practical terms, it is, I think, an act of self-harm for this country that we pursue a policy that is changing the demographic of our country in a way that makes it potentially economically unsustainable. And I think that, you know, when you, when you try to do, when you try to play God with human life, be aware of the consequences. So in Northern Ireland at the moment, our law protects the life of the mother and the life of the unborn child. And when I hear pro-abortion uh, activists saying that, you know, we, we're against the rights of women, I, you know, I have to say I reject that entirely. We want to protect the most fundamental right for women, which is the right to life, but also the right to protect their unborn child. And so we have sought to retain our law, to, to protect it. When I, when I was a member of the Northern Ireland Assembly, uh, I was chair of the all-party pro-life group. And John has alluded to some of the things that we did then. And I remember on one occasion, um, I was, for a period of time, both a member of the Assembly and a member of Parliament. And there was a push under a, a Labour government, a Tony Blair government, um, by Diane Abbott and others to introduce legislation during a period of direct rule from Westminster to introduce legislation to extend the 1967 Abortion Act to Northern Ireland. And this was a very real danger because they could see that under the Good Friday Agreement there were moves towards devolution. And they were worried that if they didn't get this done before there was a devolved government, that the chance of abortion happening would diminish. So Diane Abbott and others were looking at how they could introduce legislation on abortion. So, being chair of the all-party pro-life group, I thought we must do something about this. What can we say to the government, to the Prime Minister, that might persuade him to, to, to ensure this doesn't happen? And so, I went to each of the party leaders then. There were five main parties in the Assembly. And I asked them if they would be prepared to put their name to a letter going to the Prime Minister saying that this should be a matter that is left to a future devolved government. I got four out of the five uh, leaders to sign, and my last, last on my list was Jerry Adams of Sinn Féin. <clears throat> so I arranged to meet Jerry Adams in his office at Stormont. And when I arrived, he was having his lunch, and um, uh, we had a good chat. So he said, um, tell me about this letter, and I explained what we were trying to do. And he said, well, I don't know about this. I'm not so sure that, um, you know, we in Sinn Féin would need to consider all of the implications of this. I'm not so sure that we will want to sign this letter. So I, I played my trump card. I'm not a gambler, but I, uh, if I may use that parlance, I played my trump card. And I said, Mr. Adams, can I ask you a question? I'm a unionist, and I believe that Northern Ireland should be part of the United Kingdom. And you're a Republican, a proud Republican, and you believe that the British should have no role in Northern Ireland. Are you seriously telling me that I, as a unionist, am arguing that it should be for the people of this part of Ireland to decide what happens on abortion, and you're saying that it actually should be for the British government to decide what happens on abortion? <laughs> and he looked at me. And he knew I had him, and he said, where do I sign? <laughs> and I'm going to return to that argument in a moment. In 2016, as recently as 2016 in the Northern Ireland Assembly, 
uh, there was a motion on changing the law on abortion in, in Northern Ireland. And the assembly voted by a strong majority not to change the law. And in fact, if you set aside the recent votes we had in Parliament on abortion in Northern Ireland, that was the most recent uh, decision of any of the parliaments or assemblies in the United Kingdom on abortion. And it was clear that the Northern Ireland parties, speaking on and be elect elected by uh, the people of Northern Ireland, um, said, no, we're, we're not changing our law. That was 2016. Then we had the general election of 2017. And since then, once again, um, uh, following, sadly, the collapse of our devolved institution, so at the moment we do not have a functioning assembly. Uh, and since then, sadly, um, the, the most recent version of Diane Abbott is still in Parliament, but she doesn't bother that much with Northern Ireland these days. But uh, we now have Stella Creasy, who seems to have appointed herself as the champion for abortion in Northern Ireland. And she has been agitating and agitating uh, to try and get the law changed in Northern Ireland. And together with Diana Johnston, MP, they're also making a big push to decriminalize abortion across all of the United Kingdom. So they've been looking for opportunities. And given that we have a confidence and supply arrangement with the government, we've sought to use our influence to try and ensure that those opportunities were, were not uh, uh, made available to Stella Creasy and Diana Johnson. And we've had to delay some legislation, which we knew they were going to try and amend, and, and so on. But, sadly, uh, before the summer recess, we come up against a very, very difficult and challenging situation. Because we don't have an assembly at the moment, and we don't have direct rule from Westminster, Northern Ireland is in a kind of constitutional limbo. But as you will know, people in Northern Ireland need public services. They need access to health care, to education, and so on. So someone has to take decisions in the absence of any ministers. At the moment, we have no ministers in Northern Ireland. None. We have a Secretary of State who won't take decisions, so direct rule is not introduced. And we have... Um, uh, mainly Sinn Féin who refused to enter a government and therefore we have no local ministers to take decisions. And that impacts on public services. It hits the people I represent every day because of the lack of decision making. So what the government did as an interim measure, they introduced legislation to allow the civil servants, the permanent secretaries who head up these Northern Ireland departments to take decisions to keep public services going. Otherwise, our public services would shut down. And this legislation was due for renewal <coughs> earlier um, this summer. And it had to be brought before Parliament. If the legislation hadn't been brought before Parliament, then it would have uh, ceased during the summer. And from then on, the government departments in Northern Ireland could not make decisions. And that would have a huge impact on the delivery of public services. Now, you might say, why didn't the government just introduce direct rule? But the government is trying to get the political parties to agree to a re restoration of devolved government. So they felt that if they introduced direct rule, that would be a disincentive to the parties to get back into government, particularly Sinn Féin. So they resisted. And we had said to them, look, you know, this is going to be a problem. We know what's coming down the road. We can see that um, Stella, Stella Creasy has already indicated she's going to put down amendments. Uh, uh, and so on. So, uh, you know, we, we, we encourage the government to consider just going for direct rule to avoid this. Now, there is a downside to that, of course. But when, if you get direct rule, it means that you can no longer go into Parliament and argue that it's a breach of the devolution settlement if you pass laws for Northern Ireland under a direct rule scenario. So it's a two-edged sword. It's a two-edged sword. Anyway, the government proceeded with the legislation. Stella Creasy put forward an amendment to decriminalise abortion in Northern Ireland. We resisted that amendment. In fact, the uh, parliamentary clerks advised the Speaker of the House of Commons that the amendment was outside the scope of the bill and should not be considered. That was the legal advice given by the clerks of, the, of Parliament to the Speaker. 
but as has become uh, now his uh, custom, he ignored that advice, the Speaker, and allowed Stella Creasy's amendment to proceed, quite deliberately in my opinion, I think, quite deliberately. So the amendment was considered. Uh, we spoke against it. We voted against it. We lobbied um, where we could to try and get other members of Parliament, because of course, as you know, abortion in Parliament among the main parties is a free vote issue. They do not whip their members of Parliament on how they vote. They give them a free vote. So we couldn't go to the government and say, you must instruct your MPs to vote against this amendment. Well, we, we could and we did. We said to the government, you should say, this is not a matter of conscience. It's a matter of breaching the devolution settlement. And we made that argument to the government. We said to them, you should instruct your MPs to vote against this because it breaches the devolution settlement. But the government declined to do that uh, because they said, no, our MPs are saying this is a matter of conscience and they want a free vote. And frankly, we have enough battles going on within the Conservative Party over Brexit. We don't want to open up a, a yet another battle. So they, um, they allowed their MPs to have a free vote. Notwithstanding that, uh, when uh, the uh, Creasy Amendment was voted upon in the House of Commons, it is fair to say that the majority of Conservative MPs who voted, voted against the amendment. And there's a general election coming up, folks, and I'm not here today to tell you who to vote for. But I will say this, not a single Labour member of Parliament voted against the amendment, the Creasy Amendment. Not one single Labour member of Parliament. None. That's very disappointing. It then went to the House of Lords, and the House of Lords, despite the uh, enormous efforts made by people like Baroness O'Lone uh, and uh, Lord Alton, who put forward I, what I felt were uh, unanswerable uh, 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 and, and very compelling arguments. But despite all of that, the, the Lords accepted the amendment. Uh, and so uh, we have a situation now where unless devolution is restored by the 21st of October this year, uh, the uh, abortion will be decriminalized in Northern Ireland. Now that has serious consequences. And let me explain them. The Stella Creasy Amendment was based upon a report by uh, an organization called CEDAW, C-E-D-A-W. Forgive me, it's a Saturday morning and I'm not going to try and re recall what CEDAW stands for. Anyway, they, they had a report that they brought forward saying that the lack of abortion, availability of abortion in Northern Ireland was a breach of human rights and that we should introduce laws to allow for abortion in Northern Ireland, similar to what applies in the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, CEDAW is, is linked to the United Nations. Now, that report was not legally binding on the United Kingdom government. The United Kingdom government was not compelled, not compelled to comply with that report. But Stella Creasy used that report as the basis for pursuing her amendment. So at the moment, uh, if um, the, a devolved government is not restored by the 21st of October, the default position now is that abortion law in Northern Ireland will be decriminalised. But it's worse than that. Because Northern Ireland does not have, uh, apart from the, the, the... So this legislation uh, uh, rescinds the previous law that protected uh, the unborn child and that, that criminalised abortion. That legislation is repealed. Therefore, the default position is now the 1949 Criminal Justice Act in Northern Ireland. And the 1949 Criminal Justice Act in Northern Ireland, wait for it, allows abortion for any reason whatsoever up to 28 weeks. There is nowhere in these islands that has a, an abortion regime as liberal as that. Abortion for any reason up to 28 weeks, and that abortion in any circumstance um, uh, within that context is not uh, a criminal act. There is a moratorium introduced as a result of this legislation. And I have to say to you, as a member of parliament, 
I am appalled that Parliament has imposed this upon the people of Northern Ireland against their will. Absolutely appalled. And when I hear Labour members of Parliament this week talking about uh, the government acting in an anti-democratic fashion, when they lecture us, lecture us on this, and I'm not, you know, they're entitled to put their argument, but the double standards cry out to me that the same Labour MPs who cry foul because Parliament's prorogued for a few weeks are the same Labour MPs who were prepared to impose a, an abortion regime on Northern Ireland that not a single person in Northern Ireland had voted for. That not a single MP from Northern Ireland voted for. Not, not uh, 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 any peers from Northern Ireland voted for. And they call that democracy. The will of the people. The Labour Party won't even contest elections in Northern Ireland. And yet, Stella Creasy stands up in the House of Commons and says that she speaks for women in Northern Ireland and I don't. Well, if um, the population of Northern Ireland is not that dissimilar from the rest of the UK, so over half the population of Northern Ireland are women. In my constituency, I got almost 60% of the vote at the last election. My majority was almost 20,000. Who does Stella Creasy think voted for me? <laughs> not only that, not only does this decision lack any democratic mandate, but not a single person in Northern Ireland was consulted about this. And it's the, the Labour Party, and forgive me, I, I didn't come here today to be partisan. I'm not, I am not a champion for any party here. I speak for my own party. But since this was uh, brought forward by Labour MPs, I'm jolly well going to call them out on it. And the Labour Party for years has, has lectured us all on the need for public consultation and they're into community conventions and you must consult the people. And what do we hear at the moment on Brexit? Second referendum, give the people a say. How many people in Northern Ireland had a say on Stella Creasy's amendment? Not a single person, apart from the elites of Amnesty International, who, of course, lobbied for this. The people who say they're for upholding human rights. So this lacks a democratic mandate, and it lacks public consultation. So we're now into a situation where if we don't have the assembly restored by the 21st of October, we are going to move into the most liberal abortion regime of any part of the United Kingdom. So what can we do? Well, obviously, we would like to get the assembly restored before the 21st of October so that we can stop this dead in its tracks and take back control over abortion law in Northern Ireland. And we are working with the other parties to try and get a political agreement to restore the Assembly. But if we cannot achieve that by the end of this month, then my party is of the view that the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland should convene the Assembly, invite the political parties to take their seats and form a government. Uh, but, but if they refuse to do so, he should immediately reintroduce direct rule from Westminster. Now, why do I say that? Well, let me go back to that little conversation I had with Jerry Adams when I was asking him to sign the letter. Because Sinn Féin lobbied Stella Creasy for this amendment. And Sinn Féin would quite, be quite happy to sit it out to the 21st of October to see this go through. Let's be clear about that. But the one thing that might cause them to think again is facing them with the choice. As Irish Republicans, you choose. The Irish take the decisions on the laws or the British take the decisions on the laws. It's either British rule in this part of Ireland if you don't take your seats, if you won't form a government, or you recognise that the people of Northern Ireland should be the people who decide their laws 
on sensitive issues like abortion. So I think if they're not prepared to agree an arrangement by the end of this month to go in back into government, then we are going to press the Secretary of State to convene the Assembly, but with the clear understanding that if the parties aren't prepared to form a government, then we move to direct rule. They're going to have to do it anyway. Because for this reason, if by the end of October, Brexit is delivered, and that's a big if, but if it is, then they will have to introduce direct rule in Northern Ireland because you, you, there, there are so many decisions that flow from Brexit that you need ministers in place to take them. So direct rule is coming anyway. All we will be asking the government to do is to bring it forward a couple of weeks. That's all. But I think that's the one thing, it's the one argument that might, might compel Sinn Féin to form a government before the 21st of October. So that's our strategy at the moment. Um, and we will need your support. Right now in Northern Ireland, and thanks uh, in particular to Liam and his team in, in Belfast, uh, there's a lot of lobbying. A lot of people are writing to their MPs, their members of the Assembly, pushing for the Assembly to be restored before the 21st of October. And that's good, and we should continue that and put pressure. Uh, frankly, the DUP is up for that. We are ready to form a government today. No preconditions. Let's get Storm back up and running. Let's stop this nonsense. And let the, the Assembly decide what happens on abortion. And that's the way it should be. Parliament decided it was for the Assembly to have that power. And having done that, they should not have imposed this law on Northern Ireland. But I think we also need to be lobbying the government. And, and therefore, John, I think there, that we should be looking at how your network of activists can also be putting their shoulder to the wheel and putting pressure on the government to either get the Assembly up and running before the 21st of October or introduce direct rule. Um, so that we have a way of dealing with this. Now, in the event that we go through the 21st of October and the default position kicks in where abortion is decriminalised, we then have a six-month period during which uh, a new abortion laws will be drawn up for Northern Ireland. And we are very clear. Uh, if the Assembly is restored, we will use our position in the Assembly to ensure that the approach taken in Northern Ireland uh, is a, an approach that protects the life of the unborn child. We have not changed. Let me be clear. If you leave here with no other message than this, it is this, that Northern Ireland's largest political party is still passionately pro-life and anti-abortion. That has not changed. <laughs> and we, again, we will need your support during that crucial six-month period, if it gets to that because we will need, the other parties will be involved in this process as well if Stormont is restored, or if we're into direct rule, then we'll need your support big time. Because no doubt the stellar crises of this world will go for something akin to 1967 in terms of um, the abortion regime that would apply in Northern Ireland. So we will need your help on that, lobbying MPs. We've got a general election coming up. In, in, in GB as well as Northern Ireland. So there's a pressure point there for all of you to remind your members of Parliament that they have a responsibility to leave this to the people of Northern Ireland. And we should continue uh, to press for that. I want to just, uh, in bringing my remarks to a close, I, I want to um, just say a couple of general things. It is a matter of concern to me. I've seen a big shift over the last 22 years as an MP. And the narrative around issues like abortion is changing. And it concerns me that our opponents are hijacking the narrative of reasonableness. They very skillfully and cleverly and deviously use language to... You know, they'll never... You listen to the stellar creatures of this world speaking in the House of Commons. They never talk about the unborn child. It's never mentioned. The unborn child does not feature in their narrative. It is all about the woman and the right of a woman to control her own body and to have the choice. That's it. They narrow it down. And they have tried to narrow and close the debate down. 
So that, you know, we are then accused, you don't care about women, you're a man, what do you know? And of course they use the most sensitive and difficult and challenging cases to promote their arguments. But never ever talk about abortion for social reasons, abortion because of gender, abortion because of disability. And I think we need to push back on this narrative. And we need to look at the language we use. In Northern Ireland, what we've sought to do is rather than play and respond to their narrative, we're developing a new narrative, which is about winning hearts and minds. And in Northern Ireland, we focus on both lives matter. That actually, we do care about women. We care about the impact abortion has on women. We care about the care that women need and the support they need to make decisions. And we care about the life of the unborn child, passionately care about the life of the unborn child. And you know what? The, the abortion lobby really struggle with that narrative. They really struggle with it. They don't like this idea that 100,000 people are alive today because we have resisted the 1967 Abortion Act. They can't cope with that because they know that the average man and woman listening to that debate can connect with that. That makes sense to them. They're even thinking, maybe I'm one of those 100,000 people. And in Northern Ireland, because we've, we've got a real battleground on this issue, we're, we're, we're pushing back on the narrative the narrative of reasonableness. Because, the, of course, one of the key uh, objectives of our opponents is to make us look unreasonable. I have lost count of the number of times I've been called a dinosaur because I happen to believe in the right of the unborn child to life. You know, what is unreasonable about arguing that an unborn child has the right to be born and to have life in all its fullness? What's archaic about that? Actually, my view is that what's archaic is, is that, that somehow you would want to dismiss that right. <laughs> Our opponents talk about human rights. They, they talk about equality. They talk about choice. They've captured those, those, those terms. But what about the human right of the unborn child? What about the right to equality? What about the right to life? And what about choice when it comes to the, the, the unborn child has no choice and they never want to talk about that. So I think we need to look at the narrative and we need to push back on the narrative and we need to look at how we're presenting our case in the public domain. Because I know society, and I recognize society is changing, but it's only changing because certain people have stolen the narrative and they're winning hearts and minds or because of indifference. We need to start winning the narrative in the public square. And that means a combined effort. And I want to thank Spock, as I did at the beginning, for all the work that you do. And we must look at this and examine it. I had a meeting recently um, with uh, Archbishop Nichols and we were talking about this and he's written a really good book. I, if you haven't read it, I commend you read it about how we need to be more effective in the public square in terms of getting our arguments across. Uh, and, and the problem, and this is, uh, again, forgive me, um, I, you know, I'm passionate about the church but I think at times the church has been pushed away from the public square, that, that church leaders feel intimidated and are made to feel intimidated by the media. And therefore, they, 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 they kind of, it's almost like, you know, we, we, just, we now close the church doors and we stay inside and we, we live in a comfort zone. But Jesus said, Let, you know, be salt and light. Put your light on the hill. And I think we have to do that, no matter how difficult it is. And believe me, it's difficult. I need to have the, 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 the height of a rhinoceros sometimes in the public square to stand up. A dinosaur. Oh, a dinosaur, yeah. But rhinos are not extinct. 
Um, uh, the leader of the Green Party in the House of Commons once described my party as, as, as dinosaurs. And I reminded her that at the last election, we went in with eight MPs and came back with 10. She went in with one and came back with one. There's more chance of her becoming extinct than there is of us. <laughs> So in conclusion, uh, you know, this really is a, 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 such an important moment for Northern Ireland. And I hope I've tried to outline to you what, what we intend to do to try and push back um, and, and to, to, to leave it to the people of Northern Ireland and their public representatives to take these decisions. We're not afraid, we're not afraid of a debate on abortion. We really are not. But let's do it in the proper forum, in the Northern Ireland Assembly. So we won't accept what has been imposed by Parliament and we will do what we can to push back because we will stand for the rights of the unborn child and we'll stand for the rights of women as well. And therefore, we need your support. Please continue to do what you do. Let's not be deterred. Let's not uh, be disillusioned by what is happening because that's what our opponents want us to be, disillusioned to give up, to walk away. And I know that you're not going to do that and we're not going to do that either. It may not always be popular. We had someone, we had a policy um, event a couple of weeks ago and we had someone came along and said, you know, it would be, the DUP would win more votes if they abandoned these ethical issues. Uh, I, I was reminded of Psalm 23, Behold, my cup overfloweth. Um, I think if you stand for what's right, not because you think it's popular, but because it's right, then the rest will take care of itself. So, ladies and gentlemen, I understand that I hope I've left a little time for some questions, if anyone has any questions, but please, we must stand for life. We stand for life. Let's do it together.